Hi guys, I'm Zizu Bergs and you're listening to the Double Bagel. Zizu, welcome on the show. We're speaking, of course, right after your second ATP Challenger win in France just over a week ago. Your second Challenger title in one month. How would you sum up these crazy last four weeks of your life? Um, oh, yeah, things like that you don't expect eventually, um, especially because St. Petersburg was my first challenger in, in two and a half years. So uh, you go there just by the that you are lucky to play finally a challenger. I knew like that sort of the level was there, but I had to play futures and, and I didn't get in in challengers. And, and before, yeah, before really going to St. Petersburg, I said to my coach, okay, let's let's play a sort of the a joker or a lot of and i just go to st petersburg hoping that i get in because you know you got to arrange the visa and all of that and eventually i got in one day before i left so that was a that was a blessing that i got in and i could play and then yeah if you take it match by match and 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 yeah match by match the confidence is growing and you start playing really good tennis and then you start to know where to focus on how to close matches and all of that and yes, yeah, St. Petersburg was like, was like the first challenger win in, in my career and, and, and like unexpected a little bit. And then from that, you, you build on further, you know, you still don't have the ranking to, to get in a main group of challengers and you try to, to battle every time you get the opportunity to, to play. And the week after I did the same, although I lost second round with, with good advantages in the match being 4-2 up in the second set and all of that. But if, at the end, yeah, it's it's. I'm still a rookie in the challengers. I have to adapt. Also, um, it's not it's not you're gonna win everything. But then, eventually, uh, Lil was an an incredible week again. Started from qualies, not even know where to enter, and um, yeah, again, match by match, you go to the finals, and then in the finals, you play another another incredible match. And that's a little bit how it goes, you know, to, you don't expect it. And every time you're on the court, you give everything you have because you don't get many opportunities in challenge at the moment. Now with my ranking, yes, of course, I will get more opportunities to play, luckily. But at that point, it was like, OK, I just battle, battle super hard to get the wins and to get the points to eventually start and challenge what I did. Eventually. I mean, how different was winning in St. Petersburg, your first challenger title, compared to your second title in Lyon? Um, yeah, I think at that part, I, I mentally grow a lot to, to be consistent at a high level, um, to, to, to deal with, um, with things if it don't go my way, you know, if, if things go bad, I, I stay calm, I try to focus on what I have to do, on the goods, and that's eventually what helps a lot, you know, because, yeah, after... The first week in St. Petersburg, I lost second round with being up a little bit, having mentally struggles, and, and, and I took it like right on track, back on in, in Lille. And, and when I was in that position, when it didn't go my way and I was losing first set or I had some struggles in the match, I really stayed calm and, and then tried to tried to change it in the match, and that was works. And I think it's just the work of, of, of last months of, of working mentally hard, of working tennisly hard, physically all of that and then it comes together and then it's just like a sort of a beaten feeling which is uh, which is more than great more than great more like in the zone right that's what people say yeah exactly in the flow in the zone everything mm. i mean would it be safe to say your title in leon was more happiness than relief considering you already won your first title um early in the month um yeah i, I like i think the good feeling about about lil was in the run through, I threw the matches up to the final. I was never satisfied with an end in the tournament. Like even it was semis and I didn't even expect it to get in the draw. I, I, I was not pleased with the semifinal. I wanted more. And that was, that was something inside me, a fire that really kept me going. And eventually after I won the final, it was really my, my goal to win the tournament because once you're in the finals, the, the points are massively uh, in an, a changing like uh, final is 50 points and winning is 90 points which is massive difference so i really wanted that and after i won my second challenger it was like first oh fuck i closed this match like going in the tie break in the third set against the first seed uh already had two match points on the serve not taking it and at that point, it was just that feeling. But after, okay, when you take the, the car back home a few days later, you really start to realize 
what you are doing and what you have done and then that's something like yeah fuck like knowing it's incredible what i did but on the other hand, other hand not being that satisfied yet because it's not my goal to be a, a 260 player i want to be top 100 i want to go further more up so i think it's it's an advantage that i'm not that satisfied with what i've done and that i want more and that i'm hungry to get more i mean correct me if i'm wrong here but it seems that your 2021 season started rather slow then boom, something happened the past two months. What changed between the start of the year and now? Well, I, th I think the year didn't start that bad. Um, you got to, everyone has to know that the futures, that they are still pretty strong. You will have to be good players also that will have, that will do results in challengers as well. Um, and that's a little bit what happened, I think. Uh, the first tournament of the year, I lost against a big player who's very tall, big service, and the, the marches are so small that every opportunity you have, you have to take, and if you don't, you can go down, and that's what happened. I didn't take my opportunities, and I lost. And then second week, I lost against a great player, uh, Runa Holdren, in the semifinals. Yeah. And, you know, those are matches that, that eventually uh, keep you from winning titles. Um, because if you go through tough matches, you get more opportunities to play better, to start getting confidence. And so eventually, I don't think it was a bad level. Even all, the only thing I, I have a little bit like bad feelings with is when, when I went to Egypt two weeks, both first rounds and, and, and futures. But then I took two weeks off to train hard and, and to really have a settle, like a mentally setback to feet on the ground what what do you have to do how to play grass and all of that and so the level was sort of there it just had to explode a little bit i just had to have a bit better draw and the thing in challenge is that every match you play is like an opportunity and in futures every match you play is more like your favorite role and you have to win it and if you win it you don't get as many credits as in challenge and i think it was a little bit a different mindset which you have to learn in the future like um, if I'm a favorite, how to really deal with that and how to deal with the favorite, uh, the favorite role to really win matches. I mean, you've been a professional tennis player for around three years now. How would you describe the journey? Uh, well, the, the three years were with a lot of ups and downs. Um, I think I started really good. Um, I went pretty quick to number 380. Um, and then it was uh, a little bit of hustle with, with the new ranking system with IT about me as a number 380, not entering challengers anymore. Uh, I have to replay the futures and then I, I got an injury after one year. And since that point, it was, uh, it was a tough road. Um, you know, being out like months it's not easy and then finding your way back it's not easy and eventually I decided you know to that I needed something else that I needed to go out of my environment to really find the joy again to find like the hustle the grind to really enjoy that part and it's what happened I went to Barcelona and it was really uh, yeah like really tough not being away because I felt myself like happy and all of that but really to match by match trying to, to, to be better, to be a better player every tournament you play, um, which was going very slowly. But the thing was, every match I played, every tournament I played, I was a little bit a better player. So I came from far. And I think at that point, uh, the lockdown was something good for me. Um, yeah. Because it brought me back to the environment where yeah. I was, with the environment I want to work with at the Federation in, in Flanders, Belgium. Um, really uh changed some aspects in my in my game like really changed my forehand my foreign grip even because if i didn't do that i think it would be very hard to to have a chance to be a top 100 player at the moment um so i really yeah worked very hard in, in the lockdown like to change a lot of things to really try to be dedicated on it even though it's not working yeah. Um, and and uh, and I think yeah. f starting from October at the European Open in Antwerp, it really changed a lot of me for me, a lot of, of in perspective things. And at that point, I think it was a little bit of boom, and I yeah, I tried to continue on that Elon in in that vibe. And uh, yeah, and, and the two challenges I played is paying off, and and I hope 
you know, if the, if the plane is launched to, to keep it in the air and then keep, keep flying high. I mean, as a kid, you have all these expectations of being a, um, all these dreams, I guess, of being a professional tennis player. Has everything about it lived up to your expectations? Um, if you dream as a kid, you only, of course, see Wimbledon, you see the top two, you see the, yeah, the top one, you see the masters and all of that. So you don't, you, you won't see the jungle of the futures. You won't see the middle jungle of the challengers. You won't see that part. But even though I didn't see it, like fooling my expectations, all of that, it's really still a beautiful road. You got to be actually got to be prized and lucky that you have the opportunity to make it from your thing you love to make it your job. Um, yeah. If I look at my friends or my family and all of that, I'm really like uh, privileged to, to, to be a tennis player that I can work hard every day to become a better player, to eventually earn a lot of money and go into the tournaments you're dreaming of. You know, um, if you would say, uh, if I was a little kid, I would see European Open and enter, but my TV for sure it was a dream. And, um, and I, I stood there, I won a match. I, I played an incredible match in the second round. And that's a little bit the, the dreams you're fulfilling at that point. Also like Davis Cup is coming closer. Um, but yeah, the, the, the jungle you won't see, and then the jungle is a tough road. But if you go through it, and and you will uh, appreciate a lot. I mean, talk to me about Antwerp 2020. It's the tournament where the tennis world first heard of you. Where were you when you got the call that you got the wild card? Yeah, it, um, that was uh, very unexpected. The wild card. Um, all the years before, I was uh, I was always getting a wild card in qual in qualis. Um, yeah. And I always did actually pretty well, except for the second time I was playing City Pass and I lost like four and one, which is pretty tough. But yeah. all the other matches, it was like like seven six in the third against Felix Ogialesim, Pierre Hugh, Herbert, which are great players. And I was still very young, so that was like good results. And I was actually expecting to go to to Bratislava but they canceled like a week before so I couldn't go there and then I was like okay uh, I don't have any tournaments so we were checking because I didn't I know I was not getting a wild card in qualities this year and so I was asking for a wild card in doubles and Thursday before the tournament started I got a call okay you get a wild card in doubles so you have to come into the bubble the day the next day on Friday so I went to the bubble but then entering in the bubble I knew my coach was tested positive on COVID and I worked with him for two, three days. So that was like a very tricky part. And I knew that the chances were high that I was also going to test positive. Um, and then like expecting to test positive, Ruben Bemos, um, our number three player, he tested positive and I knew a Walker was getting free. So the tournament, they decided to give it to me, like very unexpected. <clears throat> and um, from that point, yeah, it's like, uh, okay, you're not in a great form. You're not playing well. You have a lot of doubts. You're not confident. But at practice, I was playing really good. And then I had one day practicing with uh, Tiafu, Fritz, and, and, and Tommy. Um, and that was like a, a great practice. And I was like playing great tennis, winning a lot. And I, and that, and that day it gave me really confidence to build on further. Day after again, a very good practice. So I went into the match knowing, okay, first Ramos is a player you want to play on hard court because he will give you time to play. He will give you time to play aggressive. He will give you time to go forward. And um, yeah, and the match, it worked all out. Okay. I had struggles, you know, I was up a break. He came back also second set. I was down five, three. Um, but at that day against Ramos, you know, all the things that were not falling apart lately, there really f came all together, you know, the, the ball was rolling my side and before it wasn't. And then, yeah, the, that match gave you so much confidence and people start to believe in you at that point that against Kashinov, you know, you, you're going to get chances. Okay, he's, he, he's a top 20 player. He was a top 10 player. But I know if I feel if I feel great, if I have confidence, I can play like a, a very high level, and that's what I showed that day. And yeah, it, unluckily it, it didn't felt my way. But it's an experience 
that will help you forward that it will help you continue that will you know give you perspective again that the people will start believing you again and and, and it's something you have to work with and i think also with mentally i did a great job to really take that experience as something uh something on a daily basis almost and to to build on further and that's what we did mm. I mean, talking about the match against Hatchinov, um, what were your expectations coming in and how were your pre-match nerves? It was your top 20 opponent in the day. Um, yeah. I remember that I, that I asked my agent there and, and I asked him, like, yeah, Kachinov right now. Huh? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're going to get your chances, though. Um, yeah. Because, you know, with your game, you're going to get chances. Like, and then... And, and, other people said, yeah, he hits so hard, he hits so hard, and it's something that I don't always like that much. Um, but yeah, if, if you start visualizing, you just visualize and then say, okay, the ball comes, I, f I hit the crap out of it. And that was yeah. a little bit of my intentions going into that match, really just to go full, to be aggressive, to really give him some pressure also from the beginning on, first point, because he didn't play a match before somewhere. But um, and you know, I serve if you hold your opportunity, if you hold your serve, you get opportunities. And yeah, I needed only one break point, I think, in the first set to, to, to close that set. And then you get, yeah, you get confident and you know, okay, I'm gonna close this match, I know it's gonna get difficult. Um, and that was a little bit, yeah, not that many nerves. Um, it, it was more nerves on playing on that stage um yeah. uh, but i i just love it so it's not nerves it's more like i'm exciting i'm exciting to go on this court i'm exciting yeah. you know to play against top 20 player on live tv in belgium um being a crazy underdog because i was number yeah. 530 uh so it was i was so excited for i to play that match i mean that match i remember 4-0 deuce in the third set was that the turning point and the momentum shifter Um, I was not, I was not, uh, not realizing all the opportunities. I just got the opportunity. I was so in the moment. If I got an opportunity, it fell. I didn't take it. Okay, next. And every time I got the opportunity, the same intentions to go full, to really go for the opportunity and not like making a mistake to get the break. No, I went really full for it. So, uh, I think the only thing you will have in those matches is, okay, the, the more close you get, somewhere the more tight you're going to get. And um, also the match is so long at that level, which I'm not used to, so you will get tired. And you will get mentally tired as well. And so somewhere it's normal that you won't take all the chances that you will break at some point. But... I learned so much from it. I worked so hard mentally on it. So if I'm back in that situation, I know I will do better. Am yeah. I going to get a better score? Yeah. It will be tough to get a better score, but I believe I will get a better score. I will believe I get more chances to, to win against Kashinov. Um, so that's, that's a point you have to take. Okay, what can you learn from the match? How can you become a better player, even though it was a sick match? And, and that's what I'm confident about. If I'm standing tomorrow against Kashinov, I know I will get also opportunities to close the match. I mean, was it more of a case that you got tighter in the big points or Karen upped his game in the big points? Yeah, I, I, I re-watched the match. Um, I think Kashinov, what he did was, was still uh, very, very good. He really brought up his level. He started to play better. If I compare the first set to the second and the third, I think the second and the third were still better, a better game from me. Um, yeah. But he was just playing better. He was not giving easy mistakes anymore. He, he started to be more aggressive. We hit the winners. So I think he really took the match, uh, although I had opportunities. Um, but I cannot regret myself on the part. Okay, you got more tight or something. Somewhere a little bit, like naturally, you get more tight, but not saying, okay, I screwed the match by being tight. No, it's just he brought up his level. And, and if he does that, the the, the, the player who's with a less I was less good as the other one will eventually break in in most of the matches and that's yeah. being uh, the advantage of, of being the favorite you will get 
a lot of chances against players who are lower ranked or have a lower game. And you have, to, if you don't take the first chance, you have to co continue. You have to be consistent, and eventually the the lower player will break a little bit. And that's what happened. I was a lower player. I broke a little bit in the last games of the set. Um, so that's a little bit the situation. And, and still, it's normal as being, at that point, number 530 with zero experience in the highest level. I mean, how would you compare winning your ATP uh, main draw debut to winning those two challenges title early in uh, last month? I think the challenges are way more strong. Um, I also remember... After a match, I played against Kashnov and, and I went to him and I asked him some advice, you know, just to, to see how he thinks about it, what, what things I can improve and all of that. And he said some things and, and they also said, yeah, okay, you, you won against Ramos, which is, which is really good because he doesn't give you even a Coca-Cola for, for free. <laughs> but um, try to win challengers, try to, 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 to win five cons like consecutive matches in a row, try to win seven if you enter from qualities. It's, it's way more difficult than winning one, one match and playing a good match against Kashinov. Yeah. He said that at that point. And then after St. Petersburg, I was like, first thing I, 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 when I was out of the prize ceremony, I said to my coach, yeah, I remember Kashinov telling me that and now yeah. I'm doing it. So I, I knew at that point already it's, it's way more strong than, than, than my road in, in Antwerp. And, and then even confirming in, in Lille is, is even more strong. And so I, I'm, if I put those next to each other, I would say, okay, Antwerp is this way more unbelievable experience because first there was also the crowd, um, live TV, and my first experience on that stage. But uh, St. Petersburg and Lille are, are way more stronger in, in result and, and performance than, than Antwerp. Mm. I mean, Zizou, I've read somewhere that your idols growing up were Andy Roddick and Joe Wilfred Songa, and I can see both of their games and yours. I mean, the aggressiveness of Roddick and Songa's use of like the crowd and the emotion. Would you agree? Yeah, there are some things you can compare. Definitely. Um, you, when I was a young kid, it was my <laughs> you were my idol, and um, although I don't remember that much of him playing, of course, I remember some things, um, especially Serbs will always stick to people's mind. Um, and also he is expressive to the, to the crowd and all of that. So the, those are things we got to love. And, and it's not because I look up to him, it's just my natural being, being Zizou, being the guy who loves to play with the crowd, the guy yeah, who, who likes to, to hit aggressive, who likes to go for it. It was always my natural being a young kid. And at the at a certain age, it's just like to finding a balance between being efficient and aggressive and playing forward. And that's something my coach really taught me. He really helped me in that part. And I think it's working out uh, pretty well to find the balance. I mean, did you idolize like top Belgium tennis players like Kim Kleisters or Justin Hennen, even though Justin was maybe a bit before your time? If I followed them or... I followed them or idolized them, I guess, yeah. Uh, um, well, of course, they are like really high rated in Belgium at that point when you watch them and you were a tennis player. So, of course, you will you will wake up in the night to watch the matches, to watch the finals. Um, you will watch uh, winning them sick titles at a the, at the young age. Um, so, for sure, somewhere there are your idols, there are your inspiration and all of that. But on the other hand... <laughs> It is, it is pretty tough to deal with that at a, at a certain point because, I mean, I'm, I'm not feeling any competition of, of somewhere with them because they are incredibly high. They're, they are like legends. They are the goats of the woman tennis. But the Belgian people, it's pretty funny. and that, that, That's how we are, the Belgian people. The Belgian people expect to have the same. And then when you have a coffin in the top 10 at the point, yeah playing finals in the Masters, they are happy, but they're not like, wow, what, what the hell is going on? They expect to have another crisis and Hannah at the same point, having the yeah. number one and the two in the world. And then we haven't, we haven't had it in man tennis and they expect it somewhere. Um, and for me personally, it's not affecting me or anything else, but I know for the federations in Belgium, it's pretty tough to deal with that because the, the people are criticizing easily about that. But, 
it really helped tennis grow in Belgium. It really helped tennis be more popular. So at the other part, it's so good that we have a, we had a had a Kleiser and a, and a, and a in, in our country. Yeah, I mean, you talked about David Goffin. Are you friends with him? Do you any contact with him or no? No, barely not. Um, he comes like a few weeks in Belgium um, a year because he lives in Monaco. He's also from the French part um, of yeah. Belgium. So I, I barely speak to him, uh, honestly. Um, I wish we had that more contact because I can learn a lot from him. But uh, he, has, he has his career, he has his environment. So I, I understand it's not something you want to have a lot of weights on your shoulders of other people asking you and then sending you texts and all of that. And when sometimes he's in Belgium, I think he will ask me to, to practice. He did it before in the preseason. He, he asked me to play in, in Liège with him. He came one day to the Federation to practice with the Davis Skip squad. Um, so it's good to have him also a few times a year in Belgium that he can show to the younger ones um, how it is and to also like have an opportunity to practice with him and, and really learn uh, from that practice because, yeah, it's not easy in Belgium to have a lot of good players at the same place, to be honest. So if he comes, yeah. It's, it's, a way, it's, yeah, it's a big advantage for, for everybody. I mean, Zizu, are you from a tennis family? Where does this passion from tennis come from? Do any of your family play? Yeah, um, uh, at the point I started tennis, uh, all the family of my father, they were all playing tennis at that point. Everybody was playing tennis. Um, and it really started from my dad. Uh, yeah. Before my dad, of course, my grandparents. But my dad was a potentially great player. Uh, he had a lot of potential, but um, the system was not that easy when he was 14 years old. So he, the parents of him decided that he had to go to the boarding school to focus on his studies and all of that. So he couldn't really continue with tennis. But before he played like semis in the, in the, Bash, in the Belgian uh, championships and all of that, which is pretty great. Um, so I think the, the talent and, and the, uh, the passion for tennis really is something for my father. Um, and that's like there was a tennis club uh, 200 meters from my home. I went there by bike. I, I played against the wall hours and hours. And then the first game started. And, you know, that's a little bit how I roll into tennis. And then I'm, I'm really lucky and privileged that my parents really wanted to drive a lot with me to go yeah. to tournaments, to go to practice. Because if you don't have that, it's so damn difficult to really start something if you don't have the talent of, of a Titi Pass or Felix or GLSC. So that was a lucky part of me. <laughs> I mean, tell me about other influences in your life that you count as maybe milestones or turning points besides Antwerp last year, your two challenger title, and maybe your, your parents. Any other major milestones or turning points? I think uh, a point that, that will, will help me a lot in the future is really when, when it was going really bad. Um, because, you know, you start to doubt if you want to continue uh, being a tennis player because you will have tough tough periods and all of that. And at that point, my parents helped me a lot. I went to Barcelona and I tried to, to get the joy again because but the thing you learn there, and it's so important, and, and I will take it for the rest of my career, that when things go bad, a lot of people will, will fall away. They won't, they won't text you anymore. They won't talk to you anymore. Um, and then you know who the real people are, and it's so mainstream a little bit because many people say, but I had I had experience in the reality, um, and and I realized okay, my friends they're always there, and my family is always there, and those other people I will, I will keep track on, I will keep them close with me, and then okay, then there was the boom in Antwerp, and then oh, so many people on you who want to text you and want interviews, oh, want to become your friend and all of that, and then. Okay, Sisu, remember a few weeks, even a few weeks ago, uh, though they were not talking to you, but they were talking. And that's something I think every day with me to really keep that, keep that, um, the core and, and the core values with me and in the future also. And also uh, n now if, 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 okay, I want to challenge, if it doesn't go so well anymore, I know I'll, I will be in the same situation and I know how to deal with it better than before. And then maybe some other turning points. I think I, I did a pretty good junior career as well, um, yeah. knowing that it could be much better 
that I had much more potential in me than I, what I did. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest turn point is, is like, it's like 2020, um, and 2019 and the end having such a bad season, starting a really bad season. Then, then, then the lockdown having a really bad national summer. Yeah, and then having this explosion in in Antwerp is really, I think, in my career, the biggest turn that I could get. Mm -hmm. You talked about Barcelona. Was that some kind of you were training in an academy, or what was it? Yeah, it was uh, it's, it was an academy MTB, um, and it was actually because I was working with Johan van Eric, it's uh, our Davis Cup coach as well. Yeah, um, and he decided to to pull the the plug the. Plug, I, I think they, they call in English to, to quit and to, to find another job because he was not enjoying the traveling as much with it, being on the tennis tour um, because he also has family, kids and all of that. So he wanted another career. Um, so it was also difficult at that point. I didn't have a coach. I didn't know who to work with. And then the federation actually uh, suggested me to go to Barcelona with me right. not having an idea what Barcelona was, um, but just really stepping in, in, a, in an adventure and, and see how it goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as a player who always almost had a private coach from his 15 years old, almost all, only working one-on-one, -on -one, it was pretty tough to, to get, also get in the system, um, to really find my tennis and not being influenced by too many coaches because sometimes... In the academy, you will get five coaches in there. I said, oh, guys, uh, for example, I need only two coaches. Otherwise, I cannot place it in my head. I cannot get advice from there and there because they always try to change a little bit. And for me, it's not a little bit. It's gigantic. But, okay, I, I, I like, uh, tried to work with that. And I, I was actually planning to stay longer in Barcelona. But due to the COVID and the lockdown, I came back to Belgium. And I really actually wanted to work with my coach from juniors again because... It's also something in, uh, important in my eyes to really have an identity of a tennis player, to know how you want to play. Um, and that's something I was missing. And I know uh, my old coach and who I work with now, uh, Bertrand, he really has a, has, has a vision. He really shows that vision to you. Everybody knows almost what that vision is. And, I, and he really taught me again how to play forward, how to create your own identity by serving big, hitting big. Uh, being the expressive player, the aggressive player also. Um, and it really helped me a lot. I mean, Zizu, what else are you good at? Apart from playing tennis and making tennis TikTok videos, I've heard music as well, the piano and guitar. Yeah, I play a little bit. I play a little bit. Um, it's it's tough too, <laughs> because I also, I also do university studies. So to combine all of that, it's not as easy. And uh, for example, now I didn't touch my guitar nor piano for uh, more than six months. <laughs> so uh, it's tough to combine everything. But uh, I, I took a little bit uh, the guitar again. I played a little bit the piano. I recently started a little bit because it was at home. Yeah. Um, so those are things I do. But I do actually a lot of things besides tennis. Um, as I said, I do also university studies. I also engage myself to... Uh, to society things and to have my projects to, to support things. As as example, uh, I have a project in Burundi where I send a lot of clothes to them, a lot of tennis gear, rackets, shoes. I send them to Burundi, also from other people who give it to me. And then now I started a project in, in Belgium to really help and support the, the youth who are fragile to go on the, on the wrong path, on the delinquent. And that's, those are things that makes me happy, that makes me a better person. So I'll also invest in my time in, in, in those things. And you briefly talked about your interest in music. What sort of music are you into? A lot, really a lot. At some points it's acoustic, some points it's, uh, it's even techno, it's, it's, it's uh, dance, it's like pop. Like I'm, I'm home in a lot of, in a lot of sectors of, of music. Is your favorite band or favorite drum, drum, uh, like the band is, is, is no doubt it's Coldplay. I think, okay. uh, I put it on a lot, especially in the shower and all of that. Yeah. <laughs> Gives a good vibe. And then before the match, I listen a few times, Viva La Vida. <laughs> Those are things that, uh, that uh, are nice here and makes you happy. Mm. 
I mean, final thoughts, Zizu. Uh, goals for the future, end of 2021. Where do you hope you'll be in terms of everything, rankings, everything? Uh, the target um, short term is really to, to still play the, the qualities of the Grand Slams. Um, like Paris right now, Roland Garros is, is, is coming close. I, I, at one point, I'm lucky that the, that the week is uh, scheduled one week later. Yeah. Uh, so I will have two more tournaments to qualify myself. I need to, uh, I need to jump almost 25 places. I don't know as exactly how ma- how many points that are, um, but I just know I have two tournaments. I hope I get in the first one again because I'm still alternate. When I will sign as an alternate, I will be always one out with my current ranking. Yeah. But uh, it's still uh, some someone has to still pull out at Saturday t- to get in. And yeah, and then if, if it's not uh, Roland Garros, I hope to, it's Wimbledon. If it's not Wimbledon, I hope it was open. But at the end of the year, the target is to enter in the two, top t- 200. Top 200, okay. Um, I know it's, there's potential to, to go even higher because there's like really barely something to defend for me. I think until European Open, I have six points to defend. At the European Open, it's 20, which is not that that much okay it's still 20 points but uh, it, it, it's doable you know winning a challenger and have to defend that is way more um so there's a lot of potential to even to to go way higher in the rankings but uh i think it's also really important to go step by step um the level has to go with the rankings and the consistency have to go with the ranking because the ranking is something is a result of, of, of a 12 months and the tennis season is really long. So the level also has to go with those 11, 12 months. So um, uh, at the end of the year, 200, but also really in mind to, to keep improving the game, to become a better player, to become mentally way better. So those are the, the goals now. And then from, from after this season, it's, it's like ending season 150. And then in 2023, it's ending season top 100. Those are the, the goals for the coming years. And, and hopefully it, it gets even better. I get even higher. But uh, as I said, the, re- the level has to grow with the rankings. And what's the next tournament? Do you have a, one in mind? Or? Um, my next tournament is uh, the 19th of April. It's uh, in Rome. Two weeks, right. two challenges. And then uh, after that week, a little bit also with the schedule of, of Paris, if we're going to make it, and then also adjusting, adapting to the, adapting to that. All right. Well, Zizou, best of luck with everything. And thanks so much for your time. And we'll catch up again real soon.